I'm a neuroscientist at the University of Washington with appointments in the Department of Bioengineering and also in anesthesiology and pain medicine at the University of Washington. I'm also the executive director of the Center for Neurotechnology here at the University of Washington. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist by training, uh, doing experiments, looking about how the brain processes sensory information. Before I, I begin with our question today, what does a neuroscientist do? <laughs> uh, lots of different things. Uh, there's lots of different types of neuroscientists. Uh, 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 I'm an experimental scientist, so I do experiments in my laboratory. Uh, the What I'm currently doing in my laboratory is I'm studying these little flatworms called planaria, which are amazing little creatures that have the ability to regrow themselves. Uh, but other neuroscientists study just about any part of the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, nerves, diseases, looking for treatments and cures for neurological illness. Things like a stroke, spinal cord injury, schizophrenia, uh, you name it, multiple sclerosis, uh, blindness, uh, auditory problems. So neuroscientists are working in laboratories and also in clinics to help people who have diseases of the nervous system and just discovering more about how the brain works. Well, wonderful. You sound like the perfect person to help us uh, answer answer this question. Um, so our, our viewer, Lucia, or Lucia, I'm not sure, she asks us, do we only use 10% of our brain? But before you get into that, once we, we went through our research and started looking around and I started to remember, this has been mentioned in movies all over the place um, that we 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 are we're not um, we don't use 100 uh, percent of our brain, meaning that we're uh, we're capable of doing so many like almost supernatural superhero type of thing, lifting a lot of weight and whatnot. So please go ahead and help us clear this out. Is this even true? Is this remotely true? And where does this claim come from? Okay, lots of lots of questions there. So let's first start with some of the movies that you mentioned. So uh, some of the movies uh, that I can think of, one is the movie Lucy with Scarlett Johansson. And yes, uh, for some reason, she had this drug in her body. And when that drug was released, she was able to supposedly tap into this 90% of her brain that wasn't being used. And she was able to defy the laws of physics, <laughs> which again, not possible. Uh, the other uh, movie that you may be thinking about is the movie with Bradley Cooper called Limitless. Now, in Limitless, I believe that they actually increase the amount of brain usage to 20%. So that we use 20%, not just 10%. But even that is not true. And apparently in this movie, there was a particular drug that was taken by the lead character and was able to develop these fantastic memory skills and, and things like that. Again, there's, there's no truth to that. Uh, we use all of our brain. Uh, we don't use tw only 20%. We don't use only 10%. We use 100% of our brain. The origin of this myth is not quite known. There are a couple theories. One is that perhaps in uh, 1908, uh, psychologist uh, William James wrote in a very influential book that uh, we only use part of our possible mental or uh, physical resources. Uh, William James back in, uh, I believe it was the early 1900s. But he never put a percentage on it. Uh, later on, there is another psychologist, uh, Carl Lashley, who in experimental animals and rats, uh, removed uh, large portions of the brain and was able to find that these rats could still do certain things, but never was 90% of the brain removed. And certainly even after those experiments were done and part of the brain was removed, he didn't test everything that the rat can do. So that's possible uh, another origin of the myth. Some people say that Albert Einstein said it. Some people say that Margaret Mead said it, but I've never been able to find a quote of attributed uh, to Albert Einstein or Margaret Mead. And finally, another way that this myth may have got into people's minds is through an introduction to a very influential book by Dale Carnegie in his book called uh, How to Win uh, Friends and Influence People. There was a foreword in that book where he referenced uh, the person who wrote the uh, introduction 
referenced William James and did attribute a number to what William James says, but William James never did say it. And so when it got into this very influential book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, people read that and it got into uh, the media and people started to believe it. But there really is no scientific evidence to suggest that we only use 10% or 20% of our brain. So you will, you will think or say that um, it, it might be uh, um, something that was invented, something like it's a science fiction, science fiction uh, creation, that notion of the 10% use of our brain. Yeah, and I think it also is used to, to sell products. <laughs> uh, certainly advertisers know that the brain is very interesting to people. And so, you know, buy my product and that will help you tap into that part of your brain that's not being used. Uh, so that's an advertiser technique to get people hooked on a particular product or so. But again, a product, I don't know any product that allows you to uh, tap into some part of your brain that's just sitting there doing nothing. It, that just doesn't exist. Now, if this was true, that we only use 10 percent of our brain, what will that be? What will that be like? Because I know that there's a. Uh, um, studies out there that have that, that show that our brain activity is like 100% at all times. But what would that mean if we were only using 10%? Like, what will our behavior be? Like, what will we what will we be capable of doing or not if that was true? Well, I, I think you bring up a good point, and that is, what does it mean when someone says, "I only use 10% of the brain," or "You only use 20% of our brain"? of your brain. You know, what does that statement mean? Some people will interpret that question as being that you only are using 10% of your physical brain in that oh, one part of the brain is active and that large part of your brain is just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for something to happen. Sometimes when I mention that to people, people will say, oh no, that's not what I meant. Rather, what I meant is that we have the potential, uh, we're only using 10% of our potential of what the brain could do. My response to a question like that is, how can that ever be, me be measured? How could potential be measured? Certainly, we're always able to learn new things. Uh, we can learn new skills. We can increase our memory. Uh, we can you know, learn how to uh, uh, you know, do new tasks. So our brain certainly has potential. Uh, but it's not because we're tapping into some unused part of the brain. Rather, when we learn new skills, when we learn new information, the existing part of our brain rewires itself. It makes stronger connections between different areas of the brain. So it's not like our brain is all of a sudden waking up. Rather, we're forming new connections and stronger connections between areas. And that's how we learn new things and new tasks. So is there such a thing as, as doing something or things that we can do to increase our brain activity? Well, we can always learn new things. Uh, so when we want to learn a new language, for example, we're tapping into existing connections and making new connections between areas to help uh, us learn. So certainly there, there are, are different uh, memory methods that we can use, different ways to help people learn new things, uh, associating different uh, senses can maybe help people learn new things. But again, it's not because we're tapping into a part of the brain that's not being used. Rather, we're using the existing brain in new and different ways. Dr. Chadler, what are the main like brain or, or neuroscience myths that you see out there? Because I'm sure this is not the only one, because there's all sorts of misconceptions about our, our bodies and our minds and our brain. Uh, if you can mention a few and, and, and tell us a bit about them. Sure. One of my favorite ones is that when the moon is full, uh, there's more abnormal behavior. There's more traffic accidents. There's more domestic violence. Uh, there's more crime, things, things like that. Uh, I've actually looked at the data, and there's more than 100 studies that have tried to correlate abnormal behaviors uh, again, traffic accidents, violence, uh, suicides, things like that, with different phases of the moon. And when you look at the total body of literature, there's no evidence or very, very little evidence. The overwhelming evidence suggests that there is no association between the phase of the moon and any of these abnormal activities. And uh, nevertheless, this is a myth that's 
firmly entrenched in many, many cultures around the world. Uh, certainly the moon has motivated people to write songs and it has changed our behavior uh, because we write poetry, we, we paint, uh, we do these artistic things that are perhaps motivated by the moon. You know, we, we like looking at, at the moon, but it does not cause any abnormal change uh, in, in our behavior. Uh, a, a few years ago, I was having a dinner with uh, actually a relative uh, in law enforcement. And this particular person says, oh yeah, you know, um, uh, I pull more people out of the ditch when the moon is full than any other time of the month. And I said, well, don't you do that at other times of the month? And she responded, well, yes, I do, but I just don't remember it. I said, exactly. And when you look at the data, when you ask people who has the strongest belief that the full moon does affect behavior, it's people in law enforcement and also in the medical field. And these are people who are you know, highly intelligent, are very educated, yet they have the strongest belief that the full moon, the moon is somehow controlling behavior. Uh, and the reason for that is not well known. My hypothesis is that these people in these fields see bad things. They see accidents, they see terrible uh, violence and it's called an accident for a reason. It happened, you know, these accidents happen because they are accidents, uh, they're uh, uh, unexpected. And to help these people who see these bad things in the emergency room, on the road, it helps them reduce their stress levels. It helps them cope with some of the things that they see. So um, I think that that's perhaps a reason why this myth of the full moon is highly believed in these industries is because they see bad things and they're using it as a coping mechanism to help them deal with these bad situations. Yeah, and not to mention that it's something that is believed in, in different cultures around the world. And I'm sure I'm sure there's some stuff with uh, um, that the Native Americans believed in that it has to do with the moon and the whole uh, mystics and, 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 and um, what do you call it? The, 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 yeah, the culture behind that, basically. Yeah, there's uh, cultures all around the world uh, who uh, uh, a lot of festivals. Uh, around the world are celebrated at different times based on the phase of the moon. So uh, again, uh, the full moon does control behaviors uh, with the establishment of festivals uh, and many artistic endeavors related to the phase of the moon, but it doesn't cause uh, people to have any type of abnormal behavior like increased crime rate or uh, emergency room calls or things like that. Dr. Chudler, this has been amazing. Is there anything that I didn't ask you, uh, not only related to the first, the main question, but in general about our brain and, and how are we wired? And, 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 and you know, because I know that th this is all an effort of, of a human mind and to try to find explanations of things, easy understandings of things, and sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. But is there anything that I didn't ask you that you think it's important for our audiences to know or to understand? Yeah, I, I think I want to get back to that 10% of the brain myth. And I, I want to give you a little bit of insight about why I believe or, or why we use 100% of the brain. And that is there's two types of information that we can draw on. One is clinical data. And that is when people have a brain injury, a small brain injury caused by a, a traumatic injury, a, a bullet wound or a bump on the head or a fall or a motor vehicle accident can cause brain damage to just a small part of the brain, much less than 90% of the brain. And that injury can cause devastating effects. It could cause paralysis. It could cause a person to lose the ability to speak. And it's just uh, interfering with a small part of the brain. So clinical data suggests that even small damage to the brain, much less than 90%, can have very, very consequential, uh, negative consequences to a person. So clinical data suggests that our whole brain is, is very important, that we use all of our brain. A second one is more experimental, experimental evidence, specifically from brain imaging. So you may have heard of a brain imaging technique called functional MRI or a PET scan, 
these are ways that scientists can look at how the brain is functioning. And when you look at a brain image, all parts of the brain are, are doing something. There's no part of the brain that's just sitting there inactive. So we can use brain imaging and see, literally see that the brain is active. And when you see those brain images, you know, with the, the, the colors that, that light up, those are usually, those colors are, are artificially uh, in, enhanced, but it's usually looking at relative activity between different areas. So even though a color might be cool, it's still active. Uh, so there's no part of the brain that's just sitting there uh, doing nothing. Uh, the brain and, and nerve cells don't like to do nothing. Uh, even if a nerve cell is not sending one of those electrical signals that connect to, to uh, other uh, cells in the brain. So a nerve cell works like a little battery and then it generates a little bit of electricity. And when it gets down to the end of that nerve cell, it causes chemicals to come out. And those chemicals are then picked up by another nerve cell, which can cause increased activity or decreased activity in that next cell. So even if a nerve cell isn't doing that and creating its own message, it's still doing something. It's creating and building those chemicals or it's trying to integrate information from other cells. So uh, again, experimental and clinical evidence suggests that there's no part of the brain doing nothing. We use all of our brain. Not even when we sleep. I know that a lot of people think that when we sleep that our, our, our brain or some of our brain gets turned off or goes to sleep. If you can tell us in simple words, what happens to our brain when we go to sleep? Yeah, well, certainly when we're sleeping, we have a change in consciousness, but our brain is extremely active when we're sleeping. Uh, it's helping us uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, form new memories. It's helping us uh, regenerate our, our bodies and maybe even clear out a part of the things in our, our brain that we don't need. Uh, so during sleep, our brain is incredibly active. And in fact, when you're dreaming and you look at the electrical activity of your brain, your brain activity looks very, very similar to when you're awake. So even when we're sleeping, our brains are very, very active. Our brain does not turn off when we sleep. 